So the alphabet recording challenge. This was a, something that I came up with um, just over a year ago, um, based on the fact that there are 26 letters in the alphabet and there are 52 weeks in the year. And I thought, well, there must be something we can do with that to get people recording things. Um, so what could possibly go wrong with it? Well, there were a few things that went wrong with it um, in the sense that uh, people certainly responded um, and thinking that it was something that um, were kind of ruined their, 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 their walks um, by having to think about things that they wouldn't normally think about, constantly thinking about scientific names. Um, for my own personal uh, perspective. Uh, I think the low point came when I was desperately trying to remember what the scientific name for Robin was in order to get it to um, qualify for week R, completely missing the point of the common names. And another thing that was thrown up was that this um, will potentially damage people looking at our data in, in years to come as uh, as phenologists look at 2020 with with um, some concern as to what on earth was going on fortunately i think the global pandemic probably um puts my uh, alphabet recording challenge into some kind of uh it makes it less significant i think in terms of uh, what was going on in terms of recording in 2020 but nevertheless you know there was there was something something odd so the basic concept was each um, week was allocated a letter and you scored a point if uh, for each species that you recorded during that week that began either its uh, common name or part of its common name, the generic name or the specific name of those species. Each one scores a point for the given weeks um, and each week was then uh, promoted using our social media thanks to um, Elaine and certainly early on uh, we got quite a lot of, um, of good reaction on, on, on Twitter and, uh, and, and on Facebook in terms of um, some good engagement going on and indeed when uh, we finally uh, worked out what the overall scores were we could see that actually there's probably little surprise really that Peter Sturgis was um, uh, led the leaderboard by quite a considerable way. He certainly, um, certainly uh, engaged in this uh, right from the beginning. Uh, but it's nice to see a couple of other names that we wouldn't, that we don't normally get um, tons of records from um, in there. So Mark, Martin and Faith in particular. Uh, it was nice to see those in the, in, in the top five. Um, See, my intention when I originally came up with this concept was that it would encourage people to look at things that they don't normally record either at that particular time of year or simply don't bother entering the records um, at all. And I also wanted to try and get people thinking about scientific names, but primarily I wanted people to have fun. And given the, the comment about ruining their daily walks, I'm not sure whether I fully succeeded on that. It certainly got me thinking about scientific names. But what about the other two? So in order to try and sort of analyze that, what I've done is alphabetized the previous five years worth of data. So there's six, worth, six years worth of data in here. And overall, across all of our data, you can see that probably there hasn't been a significant uh, increase in the number of records and the number of species apart from this um, period in um, in late spring where there's been a definite significant increase in what was recorded and if you look at just the stuff that we get from our, our two indicia sources so the sober record and the look Wales app data then certainly uh, we could see that um, the 2020 line is above um, on most weeks uh, for both the uh, number of species and for the number of records being submitted of these alphabet records. From my own perspective, certainly in the first half of the year, I was fully engaged and um, and on top of it and you know working towards um, hitting those targets. And then as the year got on, I found it more and more difficult to keep up. Uh, but if you look at Peter's, um, equivalent you can see that he really engaged with it full time the only weeks really he didn't score um, were the ones uh, before the um, forum and AGM la this time last year when he didn't even know so 
prior to that, he didn't even know that this was going on. So it's not so unsurprising that uh, he didn't score in those first two weeks. Uh, I think I was probably the only person that did score in those two weeks because it was my idea. And uh, there were two extra slides on there simply to thank um, people for participating and particularly for Elaine for the admin side of things. Uh, and also to um, let you know that we haven't completely um, stopped the idea of the alphabet recording challenge. And so we will be in touch. Um, so put in, put in your um, notebooks that 1st of April will probably be starting another uh, six months worth of alphabet recording. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, we're going to move straight on to Lizzie from um, Initiative for Nature Conservation Cymru, who's going to talk us about Natura Cymru coming back to life. Um, so I'll hand over to you. Brilliant. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me right, Lee? Yes, I can now. Sorry, my, my headset's fabulous. <laughs> Lovely. Next <laughs> test is where you can see my screen. Okay. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Okay, brilliant. Oh, come on. Right, okay, so yeah, great privilege to talk to you, even five minutes about this is a very, really exciting time for Natty Cymru magazine. Um, I imagine a great many of people listening in will be familiar with Natty Cymru, but um, just by way of recap, um, it was a lovely magazine that ran um, from, for about 16 years from 2001, kind of bridged the gap between something like a glossy charity magazine and an academic journal, because it covered quite in-depth articles um, in both languages um, about wildlife species, habitats, um, and conservation work that's happening in Wales. Um, I was a great reader myself and it was very sad like many others I'm sure when it was forced to cease publication in 2017. Um, that happened because its model had always been based on some um, generous government funding support um, that was withdrawn in fact of posterity and things like that. Um, the previous production team tried super hard to keep it running. There was a, a crowd funder that many readers donated to and they, they tried all sorts of models with more volunteer input and things but that that just didn't work sadly so it, it ceased publication in 2017 so amazingly three years ago now and um, fast forward a year and um rob parry who again i'm sure many of you will know um managed to get his own um cio um, recognized by the charity commission the initiative for nature conservation company uh, inc which is who i'm working for now so um this was a, a year later and then fast forward another year um, and we're where we're at now with um the delight of uh being able to tell you about the official relaunch which has just happened so um, in terms of the magazine starting in, I have to thank the Morgan Perry Foundation and Waterloo Foundation because um, they've provided um, funding for the startup costs, obviously, while they're not, um, not been taking subscriptions while I've been working as editor so far. Um, thanking past readers of Natty Cymru as well, because the money that was left from the amazing crowdfunder um, was transferred to Inc to, to help with this as well. And the previous production team from the Notcliffe Profit Company who ran it originally have been very kind with their expertise and time. So fantastically, this is the first of the new editions, which is out now. We picked up the first copies yesterday, um, so it's, it's brilliant to have this in hand. Um, a free copy is going to everybody who was a subscriber when it closed in 2017 to reflect the generosity of people who um, contributed to the crowdfunder that's helped get it up and running again. Um, so yeah, we've got this copy out now. Um, this slide is just to give you an idea of some of the features in it. We've got three major features, um, Rob Parry on Marsh Artillery, reinforcement project in South Wales, um, farming in the Elan Valley, and a Welsh language article on Celtic rainforests. One of the things we've started to do with this new run of the magazine is to set some new recurring features. So um, one we were keen for is Emerging Voices, which is a space that we're going to give each edition to an early career uh, writer, which on this occasion is Naomi Davis on Welsh hedgehogs. Um, also a, a recurring feature on um, current academic research on the environment in Wales, which this time is Liz Morris Reb on coastal collecting. And we've also decided to introduce an, a sort of Sunday newspaper style interview with Feature so that we can find out a bit more about the careers and lives of key conservation um, people in Wales, which is Tony Cross in his first edition, which is a, a great read. And of course, there's a, a massive um, a collection of individual uh, what species, habitat and project articles, which just by two examples, because Flathorn was mentioned today. So there's a Flathorn piece and a Natterjack Toads piece in there, uh, along with many others. So it's been great fun working with the authors and I hope it will be a really good read. Um, a few changes to mention, we're now only publishing every six months. We obviously had to address the financial model that wasn't working previously. Um, postage is very expensive, so we're gonna be twice a year, um, which is a bit more sustainable as well in terms of transport and things. 
but each edition is a bit larger in dimension than Full Match British Wildlife and it's substantially longer. So we're looking at 68 pages per edition. It's still hard copy because we know from our readers it's just something that they love to have in their hand. And uh, the subscription is £30 a year. That is the break even price that we worked out if we can achieve the same number of subscribers that there were before and can sustain ourselves then just the subscription, which is what we have to aim for. So if anyone's keen to read the magazine, we really hope they will because we're really going to be dependent on our readers to make it sustainable. You can go to the Inc website, which is a, a brand new website up and running now. This is what it looks like, natureconservation.wales. Um, you can click on the Natia Camry tab and everything you need there is uh, to subscribe um, by direct debit if you can, because we're, we're tiny and we need to minimise the paperwork. There's only two of us part-time working there. And that is everything. Thank you very much. Um, look us up on social media and on the web. And we really hope that you'll enjoy the magazine and feedback anything you can. Would be great. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Lizzie. I'm sure lots of people are excited about that um, coming back to life. And um, we'll go straight on to David Barden. He's going to talk about um, detailed site based recording in Lantricent Common. So, right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'll share my screen. Just give me a moment. You're a little bit quiet, so if you can okay, I'll try and speak up a bit. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, is that that's, good? That's great. Good, thank you. Hello, I'm going to talk about my experiences of doing a detailed study of a single site, uh, and answer one question really, which is, why bother? So, first of all, some essential facts. Um, I studied Lantrisant Common, which is about half a square mile of mostly marshy grassland. Sorry, David, to interrupt. Hello. Are you trying to screen share right now? Because we're not yes. seeing it. Did it not work? Let's try again. Um, that should be that should be working. Let's, let's try. Um, oh, there we go. Let's try again. I'm sorry about that. I, a bit of a glitch there. Let's um, yeah. let's let's just start at the start so I can. Um, there we go. Can everyone, can everyone see me now? Can everyone yes. see the screen now? Sorry yes, about that. Brilliant, right. thank you. You told site-based recording anyway, and the answer to the question, why, why bother? So my um, project was some essential facts. Um, it was certainly Lancaster Common, which is about half a square mile of mostly marshy grassland. The recording was spread over nine years, with most of the effort being made in the last three. Uh, I looked at vascular plants, um, of which I made nearly 12,000 individual records. And most of those were at 10 meter or one meter resolution. And as to why, um, I've come up with four benefits of this rather detailed approach. The first main benefit is simply finding more stuff. Um, I found 408 species and hybrids in total. Um, and as you can see from this graph, that number grew steadily over the period of the survey. Um, this was mostly through making a concerted effort to look out for things like this elm that somehow escaped my notice for six years. Um, improving my spatial coverage of the site, so essentially looking in all the obscure corners, and improving my understanding of the plants themselves, with willows being a good example of that. Another benefit was finding interesting species, um, and especially things that you'd be unlikely to stumble across on a single visit, such as rare or overlooked plants with a short season, um, hybrids such as this very rare hybrid willow herb, um, and also variants and colour forms such as this very striking ragged robin. Another benefit is the insights you gain into habitats, distributions and populations, especially when you start recording at high resolution. Um, for example, mapping Bettany at 10 meter resolution shows how it likes the, the steeper, more well-drained slopes on the common. Um, and there are lots of other examples of these insights that I gained during my survey. Finally, an intense study of a site really, I think, helps you to improve your ID skills um, as it forces you to identify things at different times of the year or in dis different stages of development and it encourages you to have a go at difficult groups that you may have previously ignored such as in my case eyebrights. But over and above these four main benefits what our detailed survey will of course give you is lots of information. Um, you'll, of course you'll have lots of records 
objects. But you will also have gained, and you will also may also have lots of photos, and you will probably also have gained an understanding of the habitats and the management and the effect that that's had on the species that you see there. And you may also have got hold of some historical information, um, old photos, old records, memories of what the site was like in the past, and how that affects what you find there today. All of these extra things build up a picture of a site, which I think can be really useful, but it's only useful if you pass that information on. Um, so I would urge you, if you're studying a site in detail or are planning to, as well as submitting your records, write it up. Bring all that extra information together, summarise your findings. Um, and this could be in various forms, but it could be a series of blog posts, an article in the Zubrek newsletter, or even if you're um, totally crazy, you might want to publish a book about it. And here I will shamelessly promote what I did done for Landis and Common. In conclusion, I think that detailed site best studies can be very worthwhile. Um, they're worthwhile for you as a learning experience. They're valuable for other people who are interested in the site. And most importantly, they're a fascinating record for future naturalists who will have access to all that extra information that may otherwise have been lost. Thank you. Super, thank you, David. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on the book myself as a local resident. That's good. So we'll move straight on to um, Rebecca Wright Davis from Subrec, who is going to be talking about the um, Subrec Recorders grant. Are you able to share your screen, Becky? Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, Rebecca Wright Davis. I work. I uh, obviously work for Subrec. I'm the Senior Data and Inquiries Officer there. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Subrec Recorders grant scheme. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the aim of the grant is to support and encourage what, uh, recording in South East Wales um, and improve the flow of data to Subrec. Um, and we basically um, put together this um, the grant scheme this time last year with the hope that we would, um, we, we always plan to launch it in the March um, period so that there would be plenty of time to go into the new recording season. Um, but as we all know, 2020 had other plans and there was a delay on that. Um, but once um, lockdown and restrictions have been lifted, uh, we eventually launched the scheme a bit later in the year, um, in July. And since July, we've had a steady flow of um, applications come in. Um, so what's on offer? Um, it's basically a nice little pot of money, um, up to £500 available. And the, the money is available for recorders, uh, individuals, and um, recording non profit recording groups or societies or community groups who um, wish to supply data to Subrec. Um, and these are the types of things that we will fund so, um, field or lab equipment, travel expenses, ID guides. We will also fund um, people to attend um, identification courses. Um, obviously, with the current lockdown situation, there's very few face-to-face -face courses running at the moment, um, and hopefully that will change as uh, things improve this year. And the process is really simple, it's very similar to other grant schemes. Um, basically, download an application form from our website or just drop us an email. And the form is pretty short, only five pages. And in the form, you just need to provide your full um, project details, um, names and include location and key dates of that as well. Obviously, we try to minimise any project costs, um, and in that, we would, uh, we'd also like you to put in links to um, the equipment that you plan to buy with the money. Uh, you will also need to specify how you're going to share your records or data with Subrec. The form then gets um, sent to the grant assessment team and they consider the application to determine whether it's going to be successful and we aim to respond within six weeks. So the turnaround can be quite quick. And what do we want in return? Um, well, we don't want the soul, we just want records and lots of them. And also a, a brief report um, on how the funding has helped 
you achieve your recorded aims. And that report can be um, in a written form or um, uh, an article or a presentation um, at future forums. Uh, to give you some ideas of what we've already funded, uh, so some microscopes, ID books, binoculars, so lots of field equipment such as collecting pots, beating trays and pewters, uh, moth trap and battery, uh, trail camera and hedgehog tunnels. And as Jess explained um, in her uh, earlier talk, we're also funding some um, back to name analysis tests. Some nice pictures of said field equipment and ID guides and Chris Jones, who's a local funky recorder, wanted to take his recording to the next level and carry out some scope work. Um, so there's him looking very happy with his uh, new microscope. And uh, Paul Kerry uh, Wildlife Group wanted to do um, some moth trapping, um, so we funded a moth trap and battery for them. Uh, just to give you a bit more detail about um, one after point, which was the Beaufort Ponds uh, and Woodland group. They wanted to do a nice hedgehog uh, project where they tracked and located hedgehogs. Uh, they're going to obviously uh, keep records and send those records in to Subrec. Um, they wanted to make some um, good links with uh, the community and local primary school. And they wanted to capture photographic evidence of hedgehogs. So their application was for a um, trail camera. And um, so we agreed to that and uh, the applicant has um, started testing the camera in his garden, caught a nice picture of a postman, but also a nice robin too. So um, we look forward to seeing um, the results of that as the, as the season progresses now this year. Um, and another applicant, Christian Owen, who is a local um, invertebrate recorder, looks at very obscure invertebrates, um, he wanted um, a microscope to uh, enable him to do that and his application form came in in December and we decided it very quickly and he's already got the microscope and he's already producing these amazing images. Um, this is a woodlouse leg showing the spines that are needed to um, identify this rare woodlouse. Uh, he's also been looking at some fungi spores and um, very excitingly he's been looking at this dipurin which is a bristle tail um, which is probably a new species for Britain and very likely new to, new to science um, so that this is, needs to be confirmed um, and this photo shows the macro CT which are the kind of um, bristle-like hairs uh, used to identify this species so that's really exciting. Um, so that's um, the end of my talk um, it's just the contact details please go to our website um, and follow the links to the recorder's grant scheme if you want to have a bit more information or the form or please just drop us an email if you want to just kind of informally discuss your ideas um, and yeah put an application in excellent thank you becky that that bit from uh christian is news to me as well so that's very exciting <laughs> right so we'll move um straight on to lee jenkins who I'm hoping is here on the panelists. Are you there, Lee? Um, I don't think Lee is actually here. So um, we'll move on to um, Alex Wilson for now and we'll try and come back to um, Lee at the end. So um, Alex, are you there? I am, yeah, can you hear me? Excellent, yes, I can hear you. Right. Do you want to try um, a screen share? I'll try my best. I've already tried to work out the two screen thing. We'll see. No. Uh... <laughs> okay. Excellent. That is that fine. okay? Yes. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, this is a, a brief um, run through of a project that we're due to start this year um, looking at late night bath accumulations. Um, we need your help, your records would be really useful. So it's a, it's a hibernation project, um, but in summer, um, which seems a little bit odd, but there's lots of evidence to suggest that the way in which bats behave late in late summer, early autumn, as Jess mentioned before, that accumulating activity, that swarming um, might dictate where bats are then going into hibernation. And we're looking at um, 
no, my screen is on this this side if I keep looking at it. Um, uh, what is hibernation first of all? So that is uh, where bats or animals minimize their activity. They go into metabolic depression, they slow down. Um, and when it gets colder, there's limited resources available. So that's that's when they, they go into this torpid state. Um, they're not available to react quickly to predation. Um, and that means they're slow to, slow to react to um, disturbance as well. And that means that any predation or disturbance risk could be quite impactful to bats. So um, if a bat is disturbed in, a, in, in hibernation, it's gonna slowly wake up, it loses lots of its energy reserves, and then that can have an impact on its survival into spring. So bats that are regularly disturbed in hibernation don't, um, don't do so well as bats that seem to have a nice long, um, a long sleep over winter. So good hibernation sites for bats generally are bat, uh, sites that are quiet, um, away from disturbance, a low risk of disturbance from predation or, or people, and near to resources just in case. So we'll, in the last few years, it's been quite, um, well, climatically interesting. So we've got winter, which isn't properly winter. We've got bats flying around on Christmas Day. It's not been that cold. So there's lots of options for bats to perhaps wake up and go out and get a snack and then go back to roost again when it gets a little bit colder so there's more uh, more variation in bat activity over the last few years um, so having something that's um, a sort of handy for the local local um, woodland site or an area where there's decent insects or invertebrates to eat would be possibly a good um, hibernation site and, and touching on from what Jess was saying earlier on about the size of bats as well here's a, a bat box um, and you can just about make up the uh, the back end of a bat. There's little feet um, sticking out there, and there's a screw for for scale. And I've got a, a very dried and crispy brown long ear. I don't know if any you can see that. So that's the long ear to to my thumb. It's quite a small animal. So the, these sizes that we're looking at for for some some sites, these little crevices bats can crawl into are tiny. They don't need to be big cave systems. They can be, but they don't always have to be. I just missed a slide, there we go. So one question we could ask is, do bats spend all of their time in one roost? And often that could be the case. So you might get some bats, um, might do that year round. They may use the same roost throughout the year from hibernation to summer um, and, and just keeping that one, one location. Other bats may move around an, an area and consider an area, a group of um, roosting sites to be one area of roosting and, and move weekly or, um, or monthly. And other bats might move away from an area and come back to a roost, um, sort of more, more mobile bats um, and might migrate back and forth to a site. So it's, it's variable depending on the species and depending on um, the habitat characteristics and the roosting suitability as well. So our project that we're gonna be looking at in, in this year and potentially building on data that's been um, collected in the past, is we want to understand how bats choose hibernation sites. So some bats, um, as we said before, and what Jess is saying, um, come together in autumn to swarm. And there's evidence that they, uh, that some species, particularly pipistrelle bats, so the more common bats that we find within more urban areas, tend to fly around um, and accumulate around big buildings, big structures in late summer. And that's late at night, as Jess was saying before ago, that timing allows bats then to go out, wake up, have some food, do a little bit of socialising and then focus this activity, this swarming behaviour. And um, I want to understand how bats choose their hibernation sites so that we can better cons uh, conserve them. Uh, and and reason for that really is that a lot of the time people assume that bats move from a roost in an urban area to a cave somewhere that's not going to be impacted and um, buildings can be demolished in the winter time. And we want to understand how that might impact on bats and how we can better react to that. So it's a collaborative project. We're hoping to um, work with uh, Cardiff University's engineering and um, sustainable building design uh, teams, uh, looking at thermal, thermal stability in a structure and the character characteristics of the structure itself, um, and look around the habitats around, the, around urban areas. So habitats, um, lighting, which might be quite important for lots of bats we, we realise and we want to know about the bats that are using these areas as well and the, the species mix that we find. 
So we, we want your help to just log all this information. So we, it's, it's not particularly, it's a COVID safe activity potentially. So we, you could be wandering out late at night, um, which I'm sure many people do. Uh, and you don't need to know what the bat is you're seeing straight away. You can just see if you've, if you've got a bat detector, that's great. If you can identify, that's fantastic. Um, but you don't necessarily need to. We're looking for these multiple bats accumulating in a, in a built environment um, or near a big structure. And then we can look at then subsequently details about that area, which make it particularly special for the bats that are there. Um, add any other records you want as well. Uh, and send the results to the back group and to Subrec as well. So we, we can do that on your behalf if you haven't already submitted it. Um, any questions, please feel free to get in touch. We've got um, email addresses, so if you can send them to the secretary at cardiffbats.org.uk, on Facebook, Twitter, um, pick up the phone. I'm sure many of you have got my number or other members of the back group as well just be really good to get your information um, and we're focusing on Cardiff um, but this is a project that could be anywhere really so any data would be really useful. Um, that's about it so thank you. Excellent thank you Alex look forward to getting lots of back records as well on that project. Um, I have got Lee um, is hopefully here now so um, yes we have Lee so we'll go on to Lee now. Um, if I, uh, Hello can you hear me? Yes. So yes. you don't have any slides, so we'll just make you... Uh... Um, I don't have any slides because um, I have uh, uh, a few bits to talk about and I was reducing the chance of more things being glitchy. <laughs> okay, so um, South Wales Auto Trust, since I last spoke to you about two years ago, we've increased several fold. Uh, we now have around 700 members spread all the way across Wales, which is absolutely fantastic. We did consider changing the name to Wales Otter Trust, um, but SWAT seems to sound better than what. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing and what we're, where we're going. Now, obviously, otters have a range of threats. Um, particularly food, prey items, availability of them, but there's also increasing threats from pollution and toxins. Now, this is very worrying because we don't know what the long-term effects of this are going to be. And if we think back to, to the early 50s when we had major problems um, that decimated our otter populations, we don't know how these are actually going to be affecting otters in terms of breeding, etc., in the future. So this is a real worry for us, but there are also continuing threats with development and tourism. Um, obviously, uh, development on waterways, water, uh, on the sides of watercourses can have an effect. The increased amount of uh, use of the rivers, which is good because it's, uh, it's good that people get out and use them, uh, but this can also have an effect in disturbing them. Uh, there's an increased threat from the environmental issues, i.e all the flooding that we've been having recently. Um, obviously, when rivers uh, burst their banks, they can, they can uh, flood halts, they can force otters out of their normal territory, uh, particularly onto roads. Roads is another, road kills is another issue. Um, the shocking amount of otters that are, are killed on roads um, is very worrying. And it's particularly worrying if we have lactating females um, being killed on roads because then where are the cubs, um, which, which is, is, is concerning. Uh, there's, there is also still unfortunately issues with people wishing to harm otters. Um, I'm very saddened to say this, but it, it does happen. Um, last year we were involved in the first ever successful prosecu prosecution of a fishery owner who had caught an otter in a net and shot it in the back of the head. Um, I prepared the ecological report for that um, and the fishery owner received a heavy fine and a three month prison sentence. This was particularly key because this sent a message out to any of those which still wish to harm otters. Now we do have a number of, um, a number of uh, issues on Facebook where people um, put comments about we should shoot all the otters, there's too many of them. And this is very concerning. So we put together, along with the UK Wild Otter Trust, a response to them, where we're turning it back on them. 
um, and we're saying actually these are the facts and we've developed a fact sheet that we can then post to them. So we don't want to get in an argument with them, we just want to tell them otters don't breed six times, times a year and have 20 odd cubs. They do not decimate whole fish populations, they take what they need. But I think education is really key with this. Um, Another, another threat which I personally feel, and it might be slightly controversial, is the estimation of otters' numbers, particularly here in Wales. So currently, the estimated numbers is a thousand otters. Now I say this is estimated, and this is estimated on um, males having a range of around 10 kilometers, females having a range of around five kilometers. And these are taken from Randall's random samples mainly from the National Otter Survey. Now, an otter can travel 60 kilometers in a 24 hour period. So these estimations of a thousand, there could be more than a thousand, but there could also be a lot less. So if it did turn out that there are actually 500 otters, then we've instantly halved the amount of otters that we think are here in Wales. Another issue that otters are having, which is becoming more and more uh, popular, is disturbance. Um, this is particularly comes from photographers wanting to get those shots of an otter. We've had several cases of dozen, 15 photographers near an otter halt because somehow they've known it's a breeding halt and there are cubs. Now this can be a massive disturbance to them, but we've also had photographers baiting otters. So they'll, they'll put food out on the line to try and encourage otters to come and take the food so then they can get those pictures. And we've had instances of photographers going out at night with high power torches trying to get those nice nighttime shots. This can be absolutely devastating if a mum and cubs are disturbed by high power lights. Cubs get split up from mum. Next thing we know, we've got orphaned cubs. So now, SWAT. What are we doing about this? Well, we've been really, really busy. We're running an education program. Uh, we're involved with Cardiff University and S Swansea University. Uh, we're also involved with South Gloucestershire, South Gloucestershire and Stroud College and Bristol Zoo's degree students. These are all involved in talks and we're hoping to get some fundraising. Now, key to being able to protect and understand otters if something does go wrong in the future is we need to know we need to know how many there are and we need to know where there are so one of the projects we're trying to get off the ground again we're linking into cardiff and swansea university is some dna testing we're very, at the very beginning of this road and it could be a long quite a long time but what we're trying to do is establish a sequencing where we can in, extract individual dna from a fresh otter sprain and if Eventually, the aim would be to be able to collect otter sprints from certain sections of river, maybe a 10, 20, 30 kilometer, analyze those sprints, and then see if it's the same otter using that area, or is it several otters? This can also give us a snapshot of otters' ranges. Now, unfortunately, COVID has thrown our surveying training um, right out the window. We, were, we did have a program with uh, several training sessions ready to train up some more surveyors to send them to particular areas, areas where Subrec might not have any records. Now, why are there no records there? Is it because no one's been there to see if otters are there? Or is it because there's something wrong and otters as an, an environmental indicator species are just not present? So these are things we need to do. We're also working with fisheries. We've been working with uh, fisheries here in Wales, um, giving them advice, um, giving them advice on otterproof fencing. Um, if otters do come in, what they should do. Uh, this has been very well received by the fisheries and they do seem to be um, on board. Now, going back to the rivers and the condition of our rivers, uh, we've started a clean rivers campaign. Now, Part of that is to run education programs about rivers, but also we're looking into how we can report and test uh, rivers, which surveyors or members of the public or people like yourself might say, hold on, that doesn't look right. Now, possibly a way of doing this in the short term is to collect water samples and send them to NRW for, for analyzing. Uh, we're also offering free ecology advice 
with regards to developments. Um, I've been involved in uh, three or four developments which members have come forward and said, hold on, they're about to do a development on this water course. We know there are otters there, but the ecological report doesn't show it. This will be something we'll go along as, as SWAT and we'll do a survey. And then if we find evidence of otters, which has not been picked up, then we'll object to the planning on those grounds that otters are present and we need to know how they're using it. As part of our education program, um, I've got uh, about 16 primary schools, uh, including some home school groups, uh, signed up for our free river walks. Obviously, COVID again has been in the way. Uh, this will be taking uh, groups of uh, primary school children, homeschooling groups along rivers to educate them not just about otters, but the importance of our rivers and keeping them clean. This has come about because of the last lockdown. People were using rivers much more, which is brilliant, but they were leaving their rubbish behind. There was evidence they'd been there, there were barbecues, camping chairs, there were all kinds of stuff. So the way to, we felt the way to attack this was to actually go to the children so then when they're out there, they can say, mum, dad, don't do that. We need to keep this river clean, but also showing them the rest of the wildlife. Uh, we're also supporting uh, UK Watts uh, Otto Rehabilitation Centre, which is one of the only ones in the country. Uh, they've had a... Lee, Hello? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'm just going to give you a one minute warning. We're okay. We're one warning minute. a bit. Okay. Uh, and we're also developing um, a website. Uh, now, particularly the outcome of this, what I wanted to, to say, uh, just very quickly, is we need to act now to protect our otters. We need to understand where they are and how they are using their environment. If you have any questions, please contact me through South Wales Otter Trust um, or message me direct through Facebook. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, sorry. To you, um, yeah, if, if anybody wants to chat with you, they can do on here as well. Um, but we'll go straight on to Liam. Um, just change the gallery view. So, uh, have you got slides, Liam? Yeah, I got slides. Yeah, I'm sure go at sharing on screen now. Hopefully. So, Liam's going to talk to us about the Colliery Spoil Biodiversity Initiative. Cool. Can you see that okay? Yes, super. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much for um, for staying here before lunch to hear my talk. Um, it's been a few years since I've um, kind of talked about my Colliery Spoil Biodiversity Initiative at the, at the record form. So I thought it'd be quite a good opportunity just to kind of highlight where we are when it comes to putting um, Colliery Spoil uh, on the map. So I'd firstly like just to start by thanking everyone um, who's sort of supported my work, um, helped to you know, raise awareness about how special these places are, how beautiful they are, how diverse they are, as, as you can see in some of the images here, um, that they, they're not derelict wasteland, you know, they do have do have a value. Everyone that's gone out and recorded on colliery sites and contributed to, to our knowledge of understanding the biodiversity um, of these sites or objecting to planning uh, development and things along those lines. And I do think that um, these colliery sites are held in higher regard now than probably they ever have been before. So I do think we're making really good progress in sort of changing attitudes uh, towards these sites, particularly with um, sort of developers, um, with uh, local authorities and with the, the national governments as well. Um, of course, it's a long way to go yet and, um, you know, fighting any sort of um, brownfields and trying to protect brownfields is, is a difficult thing. Um, but, but yeah, I do think we're making really good strides in the right direction. Um, so I'd just like to yeah, thank everyone uh, who supported the work and hopefully going forward we can do even more um, to, to protect these really important sites as well. Um, so over the last few years, there's been um, a lot of um, progress made in understanding uh, what sort of species are found on these sites and habitat. So there's been a lot of um, progress in terms of understanding the invertebrate fauna uh, associated with these sites. Um, largely because I, I um, sort of largely record um, invertebrates. Um, there's also some other individuals like Christian Owen as well has done quite a lot um, recording invertebrates on those sites. Uh, so we know they've got really important invertebrate faunas. Um, there's still a lot more to do when it comes to things like vascular plants, um, a lot more to do with bryophytes as well, but there are individuals like Barry Stewart and George Tordoff that have um, done some recording on colliery sites as well. Um, but I think we've made 
really good progress, um, as I said before, on the invertebrate, but as well as that, also the fungi. So, so just a real um, credit, really, to Emma Williams, who does amazing work in recording uh, the fungi on Colliery sites, particularly within all the and Taff, um, but elsewhere as well. So we, we know now that these sites are really important for the invertebrates, supporting a number of rare species, but as well as that, uh, really important for fungi as well, including species new to Wales and new to the UK and, you know, sort of European um, rare species as well. So, so I think that's really good progress. Uh, of course, we've got some really standout flagship species as well. So another big shout out to Christine Owen, who um, discovered the Mardi monster uh, millipede and new to science from uh, Mardi Colony in 2017. So this is um, basically a flagship species really for all the work that uh, I'm trying to do and others as well in trying to raise the profile of these colony sites. To show that, you know, even species new to science turn up on these sites and there's no doubt that there's other uh, species to find across the South Wales coal fields um, as well. Uh, there's been some really good um, publicity in terms of things like um, newspapers and magazines and radio um, and TV as well. So, um, so some of the sort of standout TV appearances really has been things like the, the Miners Who Made Us program uh, with Will Millard um, and perhaps the best of all has been the Wales Land of the Wild um, first series as well, which um, you may remember had some sort of really nice uh, footage of, of Coombe Tips, as you've seen the picture um, there, and you might remember the, the Green Tiger uh, Beetle feature in that as well. So sort of helping to um, spread the word about the value of these sites at uh, sort of national scale as well. But some really good events as well, so um, things like this Orders Day at Mardi in 2017 was really successful, um, a really, really good event that was. Um, also had article published in British Wildlife, um, again, sort of um, highlighting the, the ecological value of those sites um, and also um, an exhibition with the um, Mary Gillam Archive project um, at the Rhonda Heritage Centre. So there's been a lot a variety of different um, sort of outreach tools. I'd just like to quickly mention that um, I've got a new website that I invested in recently. So um, if you want to check that out, it's just colorypeople.com. Um, and it's quite a, an attractive looking website. Um, so it'll hopefully be a, a good tool going forward now to direct people to um, if they're sort of, you know, if you know of any bad uh, practice going on when it comes to development on these sites or, or you know, you have a local group that want to manage sites and that sort of thing. Um, so that's really good. And I'll keep it up to date with events as well. And, and thanks to um, a couple of donations from individuals that are probably here today. Um, I will be running two guided walks um, this year and hopefully if I can get more donations uh, between now and spring, there'll be a few more as well. So they'll all be uh, kept up to date on the website as well. And just a quick uh, mention that um, Bug Life have got um, a colliery spot invertebrates project that's running at the moment. Um, because of COVID, not much happened with our last year, but this year, um, hopefully there'll be lots of invertebrate surveys, guided walks, talks, training courses, practical habitat management and resources coming out of that. And it's a Gwent uh, focus. So it'll be um, in Blyna Gwent, Torvine and Caerphilly. So if you live in those areas, um, keep an eye out for that as well. So thanks very much. Um, if you have any questions, you know, know where I am to get in touch anyway. Brilliant. Thank you, Liam. I'm always glad to see the work that you do to champion that really important habitat in South Wales and beyond. Thanks, right. Liam.